uh, lunch hour series held on Zoom. We've been doing this from time to time on uh, for a couple of years. Um, what the idea is, is we wanted to bring you a series um, one hour a month um, with one of some of those most interesting figures uh, and thought leaders in the worlds of academia, business, government, and cultural life. Um, this, this month, we're lucky to, to have uh, the city's CFO, Ed Bean. Ed, there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and some of them probably has the most experienced and educated and certified chief financial officer of any of them. Uh, Ed holds degrees from Bentley. He holds virtually all the certifications you look for in a chief financial officer in government about government finance, public purchasing, and uh, government accounting, et cetera. Uh, he's been in Somerville uh, for decades. He's worked with various mayors, and uh, we're, we are very happy to have him uh, here today. He's in charge of um, the operating operation and coordination of all financial activities in the city, including assessing, auditing, treasury, uh, collections, purchasing, grant writing functions. He's joined uh, by his uh, very able chief assessor, Frank Golden, and uh, right budget director, hi Frank, and his budget director, uh, Mike Mastroboni. With that, uh, I'll um, hand the microphone over to Ed, who will then bring us to Frank Golden and Mike Mastroboni, and then we'll have try to have some time for questions and answers. Ed, it's all well, you. Thank you uh, for those glowing words, uh, Steve. Um, this is uh, the fourth mayor I've worked for. I see my uh, former boss, Gene Brune, here, uh, where I, I learned a lot in those 10 years working for him that uh, has stood me well uh, nowadays. Um, and uh, so uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes of remarks uh, and some slides. Um, and I'll ask Mike to, to bring up the slides and then we can entertain some questions and always happy to come back another time to, to answer further questions. Mike. Sure, Steven, I just need um, uh, screen sharing enabled and I can do that. Pat, if you could give it to Mike. And then Mike, when you're done, you'll have to give it right back to Pat. You're set. Okay, here we go. Okay, so can folks see that? Yeah. Yep. So um, I'll talk about sort of uh, the broad uh, financial metrics for the city. Frank's going to talk a little bit about commercial growth, and Mike talked about uh, budget priorities, but. Uh, Question I'm always asked is, you know, how do we stand right now? And we're in terms of financial health, the city is on very strong footing right now, probably the best in the city's history right now. We're able to balance our operating budget, revenues meeting expenditures. Uh, we have very tight fiscal restraints, producing budget surpluses every year. We're going to have record free cash coming up at about 35 million very shortly. We've been increasing our reserves. We've been managing our uh, fixed costs like health insurance, pensions, collective bargaining, and our debt service as a percentage of our total budget remains conservative. So we're in very good shape, uh, but I, I have to you know, at least acknowledge that um, the difficulties that uh, everyone has faced over the last few years, especially the business community uh, with the pandemic and the difficulties it's placed on um, income, uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, changes operations, and pandemic rules to navigate. Uh, these challenges have been very difficult to face for us all. Uh, the city has uh, survived that very well and weathered the storm because of our reserve posture. And, uh, you know, we did try to help out as best we could uh, uh, with our reserves. Uh, we were able to um, provide about a million uh and three quarters in loans to small businesses throughout the pandemic. Uh, we waived about three quarters of a million dollars in permit fees. 
as well as set up with our reserves, a uh, small business emergency relief fund with $5 million in reserves, focusing on businesses that remain closed uh, or had uh, operations that were significantly um, uh, restricted. Um, but that all being said, you know, of course, you know, that's, that's what we, we that's our little part that we could do, but um, really the future of the city rests on our commercial sector. Uh, the small businesses are the lifeblood of our community. Um, they create the tax revenues that help fund our services, the jobs that provide our residents opportunities, and forming the lively squares and business districts at the heart of the city. So new commercial taxes are uh, going to help pay for the needed services um, that we uh, expect and deserve here. So I wanted to just call up um, the new growth, uh, history of our new growth over the last, uh, since 2004. As you can see, uh, we, uh, we, we, have, we have record new growth, especially in the years uh, 2018 on as um, as you know, we have strategically planned um, for uh, commercial development, uh, and uh, I think you know very good decisions by the city back in 2005 to unlock the development potential in Union Square and Assembly Square. 2012 for for Union Square, 2005 for Assembly Square. Uh, we've had the Summer Vision Plan, a community engagement process where we uh, look at the input from all sorts of stakeholders to plan uh, the future of the city. Um, and I think that uh, we're looking forward to um, development uh, further in Boynton Yards, in a belt, Brick Bottom, as well as uh, focusing on the GLX uh, areas around the na neighborhood plans for the, where the, the, the new stations are, which is really a transformative event for the city and portends a you know, very, very bright future. So just going back to that old slide, uh, Mike, just go back once, you know, uh, just to give you a perspective here, our new growth back in 2005 was 1,392,000. In fiscal 2023, it's 12,314,622, which is an all-time record. And last year, fiscal 2022, $10,724,320. Uh, the real estate market continues to be hot. Um, you know, Frank, we'll talk to you a little bit about that. We don't see things really, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a dip, but uh, but not nothing that really affected us in terms of our growth during the pandemic. Uh, as you can see, you know, residential, the residential market has been very, very strong uh, throughout the 2000s. And now uh, the commercial sector uh, is predominant with um, biotech, uh, and, and all sorts of new development taking place throughout the city. Uh, this is gonna produce a tremendous amount of new tax revenue for the city um, that uh, is there. But uh, the way we look at things, uh, we want to be able to have capacity. So the city hasn't um, reached its proposition two and a half limit for spending. Um, as you know, uh, I think you understand that the city can raise its tax levy by 2.5% annually plus new growth. So but we've been conscious to leave uh, capacity there on the levy limit. Last time we were at the levy limit was in 2014. And as you know, we have one project that is outside the uh, Proposition 2.5 uh, levy limit uh, through a debt exclusion, and that's the Somerville High School project. And we're very, uh, you know, if there's any uh, advantage of the pandemic, it was low interest rates. So we were able to borrow our 130.3 million for the high school at record low interest rates at 2.03%. So a uh, level debt service. So that's about $6 million a year going out uh, for the next uh, 28 years um, through the debt exclusion. Um, other commercial revenues, I think we want to mention, um, Showing the vitality of the city. Obviously, we know that the uh, restaurant sector is a is a major uh, advantage for the city, a major dining destination. Um, uh, the meals tax uh, monies uh, are again at a record um, amount budgeted at two point six million dollars. Back in two thousand twelve, we were getting a little over a million one in, in meals tax revenue. We are well above the pre-pandemic levels now. So the city has rebounded very, very quickly. <coughs> a, a bit of a dip. 
Same with the hotel motel excise tax. Uh, as you know, we just, uh, the city saw the opening of the Cambria, Cambria Hotel on Somerville Avenue. We have the Assembly Row Hotel. Uh, these are major generators of revenue. Uh, uh, hotel motel um, revenues back in 2012 were about 603,000. Uh, we will be over $2 million this year and we're above the pre-pandemic levels. Um, so how do we, how do we plan in the city? So we do put together a 10 year long range forecast and uh, the assessor and I sit down with the planning department every six to eight weeks to look at all these new developments coming on board, expected timelines and initiatives, especially in the transformative areas and try to estimate where we think the tax revenue will be down the line. Uh, we make assumptions on revenues, expenditures, um, as well as our capital plan and our debt service. Uh, so we do we consciously, uh, you know, try to plan out. Um, and when we plan this out over ten years, we're not looking to expend all of the money that we see coming in as tax revenue. Uh, the good financial metrics say that you want to be generating a surplus. So we try to keep uh, a surplus of about three percent of the operating revenue, so that we do not overpromise and do not overexpend as we go forward. So the 10 year outlook is very, very rosy. Uh, I, we're gonna be looking at double digit new growth uh, over the next several years with the developments that are out there, uh, especially as we get beyond let's say 2027, Frank can talk a little bit about that as, as we move forward. Um, now, despite the rosy um, forecast, the city does have very significant capital liabilities. Um, Defer, uh, after results of years of deferred maintenance and, and underinvestment in capital improvements, uh, some of those municipal buildings, roads, sidewalks, water distribution, sewer collection, and stormwater management systems all are approaching the end of their intended lifespans. Now, you know, I, I, you know, back in the 80s, we, we didn't have the money to, to do a lot of capital improvements. We, we faced very, very tough times. And Gene Brun is there. We had a go through 10 years of trying to get ourselves into a solid footing. But now that the city has uh, a more robust uh, tax base, we really need to deal with some of our major uh, core infrastructure systems here, especially in the water sewer uh, system, because we need to upgrade uh, sewer water systems, uh, stormwater management to attract the new development coming in, especially as we look at, at, at Boynton Yards. So we don't have the financial resources or logistical support to exhaustively address all of the needs of the city. So we have to be very, very careful in, in what we plan and our capital plan. Uh, a major uh, driver right now is the high interest rates. So we're, we're sitting back now, we're redoing our capital plan, a five-year capital plan, taking into account um, the high interest rates as I mentioned, we, we borrowed for the high school uh, at 2%, 2.03% a few years ago. We went out to market now, we're talking about like 4.5% on a long-term bond and even short-term interest rates are now, uh, we borrowed short-term uh, on a, on a one-year ban less than 1% a few years ago. We'd probably be borrowing at 4% now. So that means a reset and a rethink of what we can possibly do going forward. Um, Mike, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so the question I have, you know, question gets raised to me is what happens if we go into a recession? Are we going to be laying folks off or reducing services or whatnot? But uh, what we uh, attempted to do back uh, in uh, 2004, the city had only about $360,000 in reserves. Um, and uh, we've been consciously uh, trying to build up our reserve posture over time. As our free cash uh, balances have increased, uh, we've been building uh, money into uh, stabilization funds. We're looking at uh, developer contributions, free cash uh, uh, appropriations to build up a reserve posture for the city because that was looked at as a, a significant weaknesses, weakness for the city by the bond rating agencies. So right now, uh, we went from 360,000, our, our reserve posture right now, we have about $64 million in uh, reserves, stabilization fund reserves. And 
that is higher than at least 22 other AAA rated communities in Massachusetts. We're rated at AA plus right on the cusp of AAA. So we are in a very, very good position. And that's what helped us weather the storm back in 2009, 2010 during the recession and how we were able to deal with the pandemic. The other metric, the next slide, which is more of an accounting metric, Mike, is fund general fund equity, which is what the bond rating agencies look at. And this is basically a, um, a compilation of spendable and non-spendable uh, cash resources and inventories. Uh, it's an accounting metric. So we've been able to rise, uh, raise that uh, equity from 15.1 million to 89.3 million here at the end of at the end of fiscal 2021. We'll have a new number coming out with our new audit very, very shortly. We only saw two downturns during that period of time, a slight downturn during the recession of, of 2009 and a slight downturn in 2014. So that puts us in a very, very good position as we try to divide to become a triple A rated uh, community. Uh, next, Mike. Uh, and this is just some comments from the bond rating agencies, uh, you know, our bond rating AA, uh, AA1. Um, we, uh, we've been cited for a very strong expanding local economy, strong management, uh, strong budget flexibility. So I think that you know, we're in a very good position to move forward here. We need to be cautious, obviously, in terms of what we spend, especially in our capital projects, but we're in a very, very good position. So Frank Golden is here, the assessor, and I think uh, he'd like to he'll make some comments about some of the property trends and, and, and the growth. Hi, Frank Golden. I'm the uh, chief assessor and the chairman of the board of assessors here in Somerville. Um, prior to coming to Somerville, I was the assessor in Watertown for eight fiscal years. Um, the big reason why I wanted to come to Somerville is because uh, there was a lot of talk about what was coming and Mayor Curtitone's plan and the different um, new growth projects that were going to be realized over the next 10 to 15 years in the city, starting with Assembly Row, Cambridge Crossing, Boynton Yards, Union Square, Innerbelt, Brick Bottom, I can kind of go on and on. I think if Mike could take us back to the slide with the growth that shows the break between residential and commercial, I'd really like to touch on um, from years 18 to 23, largely my tenure here, um, you can see that commercial, the orange, really doing exactly what planning predicted it to do in the commercial shift from residential to commercial new growth. Um, when we look at fiscal year 18 on that pie grid, you can see that the new growth was 4.3 million and the split was 1.6 commercial, um, the residential being 2.7 roughly. Um, as we walk all the way to fiscal year 23, you can see that orange um, slowly growing and growing and growing. And not only was it the different uses that um, caused that growth, but ultimately now as we have a lot of lab science coming um, to the city, whether it's, um, we have that first it was Cambridge Crossing, then it was Boynton Yards. Um, now we we're gonna have buildings in Innerbelt and assembly. And that use is really the hottest thing that's out there right now. And it's an exciting time that we're getting these kind of um, floor ratios in the city because that growth is what's gonna really take the burden off the residential and keep that tax bill in a position that it will be convenient for families to stay in the city. As we all know, we have a very significant uh, residential population being so close to Boston, it's almost unique. Um, speaking to these projects, I kind of want to stay in the macro if I can and not get too finite with how it all works. But with the use, we, we specifically have a purchase, then we have an approved plan, and then there's permitting. Um, the Board of Assessors take a lot of pride in working with these developers to not chase 100% of market value. We try to stay in a place that's good for the developer and good for the city. Um, we really don't wanna end up lit litigating um, any of these uses that are built in the city. So we have an appraisal done immediately once the planning and permitting is in place. 
and we try to operate operate in a place where we're not going to have attorneys filing abatements and really putting the city in a bad fiscal position. Um, fair assessments have been applied to all these various uses. Um, I think it's healthy. You're not going to not have litigation. You're not going to not meet the developers in the city as we do. But um, I think overall, um, as I approach fiscal year 24, and we basically have about $1.7 million annually to defend $220 million, um, we are in very good shape. And I think we're a good partner in terms of what is happening per capita. I don't think anybody has more no growth that any more new growth than Somerville at the moment. I know Boston's at a much larger scale in Cambridge, but coming from Watertown to here, it's really, um, it's a credit to the Curtitone administration where that torch has been passed now to Mayor Ballantyne that it's it's um, very healthy and we're in an excellent position. I don't see this slowing. Uh, the next three to five years, obviously I'm a lot more detailed than the next three, but the projects that are ongoing and the percent complete that those projects are, I, I think that, again, the, the future looks bright. We've broken the record for new growth every year that I've been here. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, the next revals fiscal year 26. Um, uh, I don't at the moment, like um, as Ed said, the 10 year forecast, things look very good. And I'm not concerned our residential condo conversion market um, is very strong still, um, but has slowed a bit because we did put some policies in place for the tenants that are displaced when those properties sell. Um, not sure if anybody really knew about that, but it's, it's good policy that a tenant has a year to relocate now when um, a developer comes in and turns three units into three condos or two units into two condos and so forth. But um, again, we use an MAI appraiser on all of these big projects. So that is the highest standing you can have as an appraiser nationally. And from there, the board sets a very fair value that we move forward on. And I, I feel the future, that will not change. Um, that's kind of about all I have on growth. Okay, thank you. So we'll move over to Mike Masterboni. You can talk a little bit about the budget and budget trends. Sure, thanks, Ed. Um, I'll share these slides out. There's a little more information that that folks can can see if if they're interested. Um, I was actually I was looking back at the budget from a decade ago to prepare. The only name listed at the front of the book that appears on both that document and our FY23 budget is is actually Ed. Um, you know, I think in the city, we're, we're, we're really thankful for his expertise. Something I tell people um, basically nonstop is that, you know, Somerville's transformation has, has, Ed, has Ed's fingerprints all over it. Um, interesting about that budget from, from a decade ago, you know, we're over $100 million a year higher than that budget, and we've evolved quite, quite a bit, um, not only from how we approach budgeting, but what what that uh, document, what the organization looks like as, as a part of that. And I'll also say, I see a lot of familiar faces out there. Um, and it's, it's nice, to, nice to see everyone. Um, we really, what I, what I want to start it with is how we think about budgeting. Um, you know, our budget serves multiple roles from our perspective um, in the city finance department. It's not only a financial plan, it's a policy and values document. It's an operations guide. It's a communications device. Um, really, really important piece there. Um, and, and we want to increasingly make it a performance management tool. Um, and in that, you get these kind of four, four of many, many ways we think about the budget is, you know, it, it's values focused. It, we want to make sure that it has a, an inclusive development process, that all stakeholders are involved, um, that our decisions always tie back to, 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 at its core, the financial metrics and sustainability that we, that we pride ourselves on. That's what Ed and, and, and Frank have, have talked to you about. Um, that we focus on our core services, right? Shoring up capacity. Residents are asking more and more of um, all of our departments. We wanna make sure that, uh, that we are focusing on those core services. And, and, and also that it's not just an annual process, that departments play a critical role, that they take ownership of it, that it continues to be a focus for the organization as we go forward. And um, 
you know, just like any business, the city budget is about the people that, that, that work. Um, we're in the business of solving problems. That's what government does. Um, our staff are how we achieve that. So you can see on the right in the yellow. Uh, so, so going from left to right, left, you see the, the revenues, the, the inputs, the money coming in to the right, the appropriations, the money going out. You can see that the bulk of our expenditures are on personal services, salaries, overtime, benefits, things like that. We really are an organization of people and, 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 and you know, that's, how we, that's how we solve our problems or that's how we solve problems. As I mentioned, there have been a lot of, <laughs> I, could, I could make 40 slides on, on notable recent initiatives. I think Somerville as a city is being asked to do more than ever before. Um, you know, part of what, what we do is, is trying to be tactical with how we spend our money. Um, but some of the re recent initiatives that have really made a big change. Um, the first is a focus on infrastructure and asset management. We've created a new, new unit that really focuses on our building stock, making sure that our school buildings, city buildings, um, uh, parks, streets are all kept in, in, in better condition, um, as best condition as we can, we can manage. Um, also, we have a, about a three-year-old racial and social justice department that helps us to align city work with residents' values, reaching out to uh, underrepresented portions of the community. It's, we found that that's been really, really valuable. Um, there's also, I think probably in the last five years, the Office of Housing Stability and Strategic Planning and the Somerville Office of Immigrant Affairs who work really closely um, to support our most vulnerable residents, right? Making sure that folks can stay in their housing, making sure folks can uh, uh, communicate with the government and, and, and reach what we're uh, trying to share with them. And then something I'm really proud of and, and, and not too, uh, something that, that sort of residents interact with less is, is inclusion of capital spending on budget. I think we've, we've really been a largely service focused growth. Uh, we've seen largely service focused growth in our budget. Um, over prior years and you know thankfully to mayor ballantyne we've been able to include things like um, street paving and vehicles um, and building repairs on the budget and as, as ed said we're in a rising interest rate environment right every dollar we can spend in cash is saves us money uh, going forward um and all that being said i think we what, what we, we really try and do and, and mayor ballantyne's leadership has um has been valuable in this is looking at our revenue holistically um i think Everyone knows that taxation is the bulk of our revenue, right? Um, that big blue chunk of revenue on the left. But you know, things like aggressively saving, things like applying for grants, um, leveraging uh, uh, any opportunities that come our way, uh, whether that's the American Rescue Plan Act or, or 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 infrastructure grants, things like that. Trying to use that in the interest of the taxpayer to make sure that we're doing those. We're we're, we're uh, you know, managing the services that we have in the most tax, tax efficient way possible so that we're not over leveraging our, 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 our uh, over, over uh, charging our residents, right? Um, something that the mayor does is, you know, a dollar from a resident, whether it's from property tax, excise tax, parking permits, uh, water and sewer bills, you know, she looks at that all the same and she thinks about it holistically. And I think that's a really valuable approach. And then finally, you know, there's other places that these values come into play. Um, Ed mentioned the, the the updated capital investment plan. That's been a real journey to develop uh, in this environment, where we have uh, extraordinary needs uh, uh, and and an uh, increasingly difficult financing uh, uh, landscape. Second, participatory budgeting. The mayor uh, uh, requested and the council approved a million dollars for a participatory budgeting process. Uh, the budget team has been working with a resident group to create the rule book for that process. We're really, really, really excited. I think that marries our values. It marries uh, uh, with, with what residents really uh, wanna see their government doing. Uh, additionally, you know, increased communication with the city council, with, with resident listening sessions, with community meetings, with groups like the Chamber of Commerce. I think that's always valuable. We wanna make sure that that's at the forefront. And then finally, planning ahead, um, you know, thinking multiple years at a time, not just uh, you, you know, looking at what's directly in front of us, trying to be proactive, ensuring that departments are infusing um, this type of thinking into their projects. A, a great example of this is um, the city's draft bicycle network plan recently came out and something that our mobility team is doing um, is trying to develop uh, an implementation budget for that. So it's one thing, um, you know, to, to, to put a plan out there. It's another to ensure that we're budgeting uh, to implement it. Uh, or at least understanding what it will take and being able to make those decisions. I think that's really, really valuable stuff. So 
Um, these are some of the examples of how we're taking the progress that we've made and continuing to elevate our work to, to make sure that, that we continue to, to deliver core services in, in both an effective and an efficient way, right? Uh, it's something that, that our colleagues throughout the city, they're constantly asking themselves and, and work that folks like um, Ed, his team, Frank, his team, and I, we, we continue to support and we're really, really excited about where things are going right now. So um, I'll leave it there. I know we're a little over on time, so that was a bit rushed, but um, we're happy to, to take any questions that folks have. I'll, I'll turn, the, turn it back over to, to Stephen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Ed. Um, we have about uh, 26 minutes uh, left. We'd like to uh, do Q&A. Um, Ed, I'll, I'll start off with um, when we, a number of your charts gave us the 2004 to 2023 picture. Uh, I'm curious as to how big, if we could, you know, in terms of the annual budget, in terms of the number of employees, uh, how big was City Hall in 2003? How big is it today? When I say that, I mean the, the city employees number, the city budget number. And I'm gonna ask people who would like to speak to raise their hand, so we'll take them in that order. Well, I don't have an exact number from what I have employees in 2003, unless Mike does. But um, Mike, where where has the personnel uh, increased um, in, in, over time? Sure. Yeah. And actually, I just pulled up the the the, the most the, the oldest budget on the on the website is is from 2006. I'm looking at a grand total about half of what we have now. We're just slightly over 300 million. Looks like it was about 155 million in 2006. So that's a little bit of context there. I think a lot of the the growth in in um, in the budget over the last decade, last two decades, are a lot of um, planning, a lot, a lot of community development, community planning uh, positions, a lot of outreach and communications positions. Right, we're thinking about new depart, new whole new departments like Summer Viva Office of Immigrant Affairs, things like that. I think, you know, we've always we we we've we've tried to really make sure that everyone has a voice in the community, but. Uh, I can't speak for personnel. I'd have to look through that a little bit, but definitely we've right. we've doubled since 2006 in terms of, of dollars. dollars. But also, I, it, you know, there isn't a lot of middle management in local government, so we've been trying to beef up our middle management. So I, I would point towards uh, what's important for the development, as we talked about the commercial development, is having a robust planning department. So clearly, there've been more staff there, as well as capital projects, I uh, in, infrastructure and asset management project managers to manage these construction projects as opposed to contracting that out. So those are two areas that I know have grown. School department's grown as well. Um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, it was sort of momentous uh, for the Mayor Valentine to increase the school department budget by 10%. But there's clearly the pandemic showed that there's a need for a lot of more emotional support health type of positions in the school department, social worker type of situations, uh, given the uh, uh, situation that, that children face during the pandemic. Those are three things I can think of notably, you know, off the top of my head where, where you know, personnel has increased. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Tufts University, Rocco Durico. <clears throat> Ed, thanks for joining us today and thanks for your uh, fiscal management over the years. The and I'm seeing program. you tomorrow at nine o'clock, Rocco, right? <laughs> well, yeah. by phone, by phone, yeah. By phone, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for your, your fiscal management of the city at a time when a lot of cities and towns are struggling financially. You guys have clearly uh, done some good things here. I know you've gotten a big infusion of federal money over the last few years. Um, when does that money have to get spent by? And do you anticipate that the new growth is going to cover that hole when that money doesn't isn't coming in anymore. That's a good question. Mike can join me on this. So, um, yeah, seventy seven million dollars in ARPA money, which uh, needs to be spent uh, by the end of or committed to the by the end of two oh two four. 
So uh, the mayor has put together a community-wide process to determine how that money is to be spent. Uh, clearly, um, she sees the need for um, uh, some social service uh, monies, for example, child care programs, um, support for uh, teen centers. Um, those are a couple of things that she's uh, brought up uh, in discussions. Um, and, um, you know, I think that she, you know, and I think we're looking at it as the intent of, of is, is, to, is to help out uh, the more disadvantaged folks in the community. We're also going to be seeing some of that money going to capital projects. Um, Notably, we've committed 10 million of that money to the Poplar Street um, uh, uh, sewer rehab program in East Somerville, which is critical towards our further commercial growth in East Somerville, including Boynton Yards. So, yes, I think we have to we have to be very careful about um, commitments from special revenue that may make their way onto the general fund. That being said, I th do think the mayor is very supportive of the number one problem in the city, which is affordable housing, so that we have delegating ARPA money towards housing vouchers or whatnot. And I think through our affordable housing trust fund, we will be continuing to support that initiative after the ARPA money dries up. But yeah, that's that's a, it's a key consideration that we uh, that we plan this all out. And where we see some of some of the programs funded through ARPA on the general fund, we are trying to plan that out. So we don't have a the complete plan hasn't been announced on, on the full 77 million, but um, there's a lot of community input in, in terms of how we um, how we spend that money. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, Ed. Um, the Cooper Kane Group, Pat Kane. Thank you. That was actually a good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, Rocco stole some of my thunder, though. I'm kind of curious over the next four or five years, what do you think the budget challenge is going to be? I mean, growth can't go up forever, and we're probably not going to get another $80 million ARPA funding. And so I'm just curious if there's something that's on your radar that you're actually concerned about. You know, maybe it's we have to build more schools, we have to do more building maintenance or something like that. I think that um, one thing that this administration has initiated is um, an asset management task force and a program because we need to do a better job of dealing with the maintenance of our core infrastructure. And of course, if we're maintaining that core infrastructure on an ongoing basis, we're going to save money in the long run. So uh, the previous uh, mayor created a department called Infrastructure and Asset Management. And uh, so we, I'm serving on a task force along with many administration officials to develop a uh, maintenance program for our streets, for our, our parks, for um, sidewalks, for buildings, so that, uh, you know, we, we can better plan on the long term. So I think, you know, capital infrastructure is, 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 is an issue. Like I say, we can't fund everything, so we have to be very, very judicious. Um, but as I said, you know, in our planning, we don't, you know, in our long-range forecasts, we deliberately, you know, put metrics on there to restrict, uh, you know, what we're going to ex expend, you know, I, other issues are going to be, of course, collective bargaining, you know, we're in inflationary times, so that I, I'm sure that the unions will be demanding, you know, higher, higher uh, wage um, um, salaries and whatnot, and we're going through that the collective bargaining process now, so that's an issue, the rising interest rates in terms of borrowing, always an issue. Um, Mike, do you have any other further thoughts on that? Uh, I think I think you did a great job covering those. I, something something that I think has been going on recently. You know, the, there's there's lots of avenues of challenges that that the city has. Right, infrastructure, um, our buildings, our school buildings, um, our, our our streets and sidewalks. And I think what's the the way that the team is challenging that is is really in a collective way. Right, this asset management program looks at how we can handle all those problems in one in one simple in one in one system. Right, whereas um, I think you know take, taking what was a pavement management program and a separate sidewalk program program and putting those all together, and 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 I think that's the sort of next evolution of how the city works, the next improvement uh, process, and it's really it's really great to see. 
Thank you, Mike. Um, uh, next, we'll go to the chair of the chamber from Middlesex Federal, Adam Courtney. You're muted, Adam. Sorry about that. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Ed and Frank and Mike for putting this on today. Just a couple of follow-ups that I had a question on. One is, and this goes back to Stephen's initial question, it seems that our city has grown its staff um, at a rapid trajectory upward. And I'm just curious, are we catching up to cities that are our size or how do we compare? So I, I understand that we have taken on a lot of new hires and new departments. I'm just curious how that compares to other cities our size. And the other question is on the ARPA, Claire, a little clarity on that. I, I was told early on that we couldn't do capital projects. So I'm curious what fits into a capital project or if the rules have changed. Um, so I'll let you hang handle both those questions. Uh, so Adam, not correct. We can do capital projects under OPERA, under what is called the revenue loss provision of OPERA. Okay, so that's a, a calculation that we've uh, come up with with our outside auditors so that we pretty much can fund uh, just about any capital project via OPERA, via OPERA. In terms of how we compare to other cities and towns, uh, I, I don't know, Mike, if you have any thoughts on that. I, I don't think, you know, comparing us to Cambridge or Boston, they've got a lot more staff, I think. Uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, I think, as I said, you know, uh, the increase in staff is reflective of some of the initiatives that we're moving forward on, I, uh, you know, in terms of the racial and social justice program and uh, the, the housing stability office. I don't think there are too many cities that have those type of um, personnel or support services. I know Boston does, Cambridge does to a limited extent. And I guess, you know, I think clearly we had to get staff into our capital projects department for these particular projects. So I haven't done, you know, I haven't compared us to other cities and towns. Mike, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I, I haven't done the analysis. I, I think you, you brought up a good point as we sort of sit in this middle ground between Boston, Cambridge, and some of the other, you know, uh, greater Boston communities where not quite one, not quite the other, um, kind of growing into our place. And, and, and I think what, what, what Mayor Ballantyne really, some of the questions that she asks are, you know, just, just, just like you said, um, Adam is, you know, how do we fit into our peers? Are we, are we right size? What are we, where, what, are, what opportunities are we missing? Um, but also coming at it from the other side is what, do our residents want Somerville city government to be, right? Um, because Somerville residents want um, us to be something different than what Cambridge residents want their government to be. So trying to be a little bit uh, uh, in tune with that, I think is, is also part of the process. I think uh, I wanna throw in here, it was uh, a long time ago, we said, the chamber said, you can't meet citizen expectations unless you can be comparative to a place like Cambridge where it was the wealthiest municipality in New England. Uh, can do pretty much as cities go, whatever new new project uh, it pleases. And that in order for us to get there, we have to bring transit back. We have to develop the commercial tax base. And in the meantime, we're going to try to grow dining and nightlife so we can, we can attract this uh, urban resurgence of young millennials. Um, so that seems to have been uh, 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 successful. So we're with you. Um, we understood that there needed to be a real much larger city treasury in order to meet the needs and expectations of the citizenry. We didn't know then quite how expansive and, and frankly radical some of the expectations of the citizenry would be. Um, so it's still to make it a challenge, but uh, we're glad to see the growth. Um, we thought a high school would be the kind of thing that would be a byproduct of uh, being part of the urban core of Boston, some of them, Boston, Cambridge, and some of them. And we really think that, uh, or I, I would suggest that uh, that's the urban core that's with a level, with a playing field has to be level. 
I don't want to take any more time. Jack Connor. Thank you very much, Stephen and Ed, uh, Michael, Frank. Uh, very nice to hear from you. As always, had a terrific presentation. And for everybody else, uh, I had the good fortune of working with Ed uh, for quite a long time as a former uh, alderman, now known as city councilor, uh, for uh, typically during Gene Bruns' campaign throughout uh, uh, Dorothy Kelly Gay and Joe Curtitoni. So Ed, great job as always. Quick question for you. Uh, you made a very uh, nice presentation about the taxpayer contribution. Just to note, uh, pass the word on that not once did I hear any mention during the remarks on uh, the mid-year performance uh, uh, discussions from the mayor and members of the city council that the word taxpayer never showed up yet. The bulk of us are, are, are helping fund uh, this uh, uh, great opportunity for the city uh, to not only stabilize, but to move forward. So if you could share that with, with people that, uh, um, uh, that's something I think that should be taking note of and to keep working with the chamber as you as always done. Secondly, um, could you please explain what the workforce um, situation is for City Hall? Is there a policy now for a hybrid work situation? Is that optional? Is that something that the mayor and, um, has, has dictated uh, or is that still evolving? Uh, I can't really speak on that, and you know, definitively. But uh, decisions really been left up to various department heads. There's some departments that can operate uh, in a hybrid fashion. Uh, some that cannot. I know here in the finance department, most of my staff have been here continuously throughout the pandemic because we're customer facing. Treasury is customer facing. Assessing is customer facing, um, and my staff here in auditing pay the bills, so they're here, you know? Whereas there are other departments that can more effectively um, operate remotely. So uh, the mayor has convened a, uh, what is called a better workforce task force. Um, and I don't believe that the, shortly those recommendations are gonna be um, uh, put forward publicly, I think. And uh, so I think, you know, what way, you know, I can't, def you know, speak intelligently about the whole policy, but, Basically, it's been left up to department heads and how they how they should operate. Uh, but you know, customers have to be serviced, obviously. So uh, there are folks that have you know have to be here in City Hall, and uh, so we're here in City Hall. I'm here right now, along with Frank and <laughs> all of our staff. Thanks, Ed. Stephen, I think you muted. Sorry, thank you, Jack. Uh, next up is Tom Bent, Bent Electrical Chair of Government Affairs. Hey, Ed, uh, thank you uh, for you and, your, uh, and the others for the uh, great presentation today. A um, couple of more devil in the detail questions I have. Um, you, you mentioned, and it was mentioned in the, in the uh, presentation about, uh, you know, maintenance of uh, buildings. So one of the one of the things I get hit with, you know, because probably because I'm on the building committee of the high school, um, is the condition of city hall. I am constantly being asked, is is there anything in the budget about city hall, and um, you know what what's the plan there? And then the second question is on the uh, old old uh, high school. You know, the, I know it's this uh, city hall campus project. Can you give us an update as to where that is also? Uh, Mike, are you there? We're, we're working on the CIP right now and trying to make a determination of when we can move on the 1895 building. Some of the numbers that have been submitted are very, very high. And like I say, we're in a high interest rate environment as well. Um, so I don't have a, an update at the moment, uh, but again, uh, we are in a priority setting mode here. I think number one is we are putting money from the operating budget more so into building maintenance. Mike, I think we added what a half a million dollars. So a lot of the building maintenance, you know, have been in, in the DPW budget, but we are committed to putting more money in the general fund budget on an ongoing basis sort of cash uh, expenditures as opposed to borrowing for major building improvements, which which we really don't want to be doing. Um, so 1895 building is, uh, you know, I, you know, thoughts about uh, with the building master plan and, and 
expanding space and consolidating space and putting city developments in there, but the price tag is very, very high. So we're still trying to determine exactly uh, when that's going to happen. I think it will happen. I'm not so sure it's going to happen in the near future. That's the honest answer. And uh, anything on maybe Mike uh, can answer on the city hall upgrades so on the outside, especially it's, it's really in tough condition. And uh, I, I get that a lot from different people. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, every, every time I walk into the building, I, I, th I think about that. Uh, yeah. I, th I think, I um, think, you know, the, 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 the presentation of the building master plan sort of strategy that was presented to the city council. Uh, I, I lose track of my years already. Um, after having done this for a little while, um, I think it was pre-pandemic that it was shared, um, you know, involves taking a staged approach of 1895, the 1895 building, which is the old high school uh, auditorium building, um, you know, moving folks over to the, that building and then city hall. Um, again, that's easy to plan, harder to manage financially. So we are, we are working really, really hard to try and figure out um, a way forward on those projects, because I think you're right. There's there's value for to have uh, 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 well taken care of updated buildings, right? In terms of city hall, and there's there's so much untapped value of the 1895 building. It's 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 surprisingly spacious um, from from the uh, uh, the building master plan work that I was a part of. So yeah, it's it's a real opportunity. We're trying to make sure that that can happen. Yeah, and uh, uh, I would when. just say you know in terms of priorities, I think our school buildings got to be seen as a, as a higher priority now. What we've been talking about is this, is our community schools were built in the 1970s, well over 50 years ago. So now we're in a situation where we have to be thinking about potentially building a new school, a new elementary school, uh, notably uh, the, the, the Winter Hill Community School is in tough shape. So this, you know, and maybe down five, seven years down the line, the city may be in that situation where we have to consider building a new school someplace. Uh, that's, I think that's probably, you know, more in the four of our thinking right now. Yeah, it's just more on, I, I think I've, uh, over the years, uh, Ed, and you might have been on some of these committees with me, uh, we, you know, we went through every single city building and evaluated them all. I know I've done it. I've been on that committee at least twice over the past 20 years. And what's a little frustrating about it is, is back even back then, there were an awful lot of uh, problems with those buildings. And I don't think it much has been done, if anything, to any of them. And then I thought to go into the 1895 building was to consolidate some of the uh, city buildings that are out there now, like Evergreen Ave and some of the other ones that are all in rough shape also. Sell them, move people, you know, renovate uh, the main, uh, the old high school. And then, uh, so that way they have all the city hall staff up on the hill, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to beat a dead horse on this, but it is, it, it, you know, one of the concerns that a lot of people have is that that cupola in the high school is going to come down before it gets fixed. And, uh, uh, and that's where I think prioritize, and I'm glad you, you, you're talking about priorities because that's where you got to, sometimes if you keep deferring maintenance on certain things like that, it can cost you a hell of a lot more later on because you deferred it so long. Um, and so, you know, something that might have only cost you, you know, half a million dollars might cost you five million, later, you know, because especially those type of turrets and towers. But um, just one other quick question. I think in the presentation I heard um, that the condo conversion uh, ordinance really hasn't slowed down condo conversions. And I might have got that wrong, but from what I've been hearing from people that it, it's pretty much stopped condo conversion. Uh, it, you, you know, I, and I maybe Adam and some of the uh, different people that deal with that, you know, could speak on it. But that's what I was hearing from some of the different uh, people that I've been dealing with, the real estate people and some of the bankers. Uh, no, that's not the case. It went from about a million dollars liquid to about six to seven hundred thousand, um, which it's welcomed with the commercial improving and helping some of the residents relocate in the city that was the primary but it, it has dropped uh it's greater than a quarter of a million dollars annually in new growth that it's changed but at the same time um we have such a healthy number of three families and two families and i will say every single one of these conversions that i look at they, they, these these developers do a beautiful job 
And I think that everything that they touch is, you'd want to live in it. And I think in their own way, they're improving our city. I know the price tags are steep and everything over eight units as an affordable unit in it. So I, I think this thing, this, this policy in place that's in the best interest of the city to move forward. And I think that slowing was the, the current council's will for uh, relocating families that got displaced through development. That, but it hasn't stopped it. Hasn't stopped. I, I personally break them out. We do about 80, 90 conversions a year. And it, it's healthy. And occasionally you'll get a big apartment building that'll be converted to condo as well. And that may cause that number to spike up a little more than you think. Thanks. So, yeah. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Is there anybody else, namely anybody we haven't heard from, or I'll go back to the to the others who raised questions. All right, Adam, did I see your hand come up? Yeah, I was just commenting on Tom's um, statement. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Frank, I, I think that we have definitely seen a slowdown in what we're seeing um, on the lending side from developers looking at the, the flips. But I, I am curious if there's been any movement on increasing the density requirement, uh, or lowering, like increasing the density around the train. So there was some talk over the last year or two about rezoning and increasing the allowed density along the uh, rail line area so that we could um, make those projects a little bit more uh, profitable for the developers so that they would get in and do it. Has there been any talk about that? I know that you know with the current way we do it, it developers are still shying away from those projects because the cost of building is still too expensive to do what the city wants it to do. And I don't know if we have uh, gotten in and talk to some of these developers to try and get those projects built at a cost that makes sense for both sides. I mean, I'd probably defer that answer to planning just because um, people, what you need to understand about my job is when it when it gets to Frank Golden, it's it's permanent, it's real. Yeah. Um, the that's an interesting question that I'd. You know, we're all for controlling the density around the the T and the train. You know, I I agree, um, but I haven't heard anything that has me concerned or worried about that. Um, I think more or less what happened during COVID with the with the development is in in the millennials that were trying to attract to the city is a lot of them went home. A lot of them left the apartments in uh, assembly and went back with their parents or wherever they were in, in, I, cause I get all the complaints about the vacancy over at uh, assembly row. Um, yeah. But, but I'll tell you that, that I'm not seeing that big of a difference in the rents and the vacancies are healthy and it, it, it wasn't the way it was. No, but I, I think it'll come back um, as we get this pandemic under control. But um we're, yeah, Frank, and hopefully people start getting pulled back into the office. I think that will help too. A lot of companies are bringing people back. Well, the chamber looks forward to working with your departments. Um, we want to compliment the work that you do and that you've done. Uh, you're kind of the unsung dimension of uh, City Hall. Uh, we always appreciate what you've been doing and uh, would like to work more closely together and um, uh, more publicly uh, as well. Um, I wanna remind people that this is, we're looking to put back this uh, monthly series uh, next uh, February 7th at noon, uh, Tuesday, February 7th, we're gonna have the new president of the city council, Ben Ewan Campen. Um, so we'll invite you all back and uh, bring your friends and colleagues. With that, I wanna say thank you to our guests for a great presentation and great conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all along the way. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. We enjoyed well it. Done. Thanks everyone, take care.